Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. program of the Commonwealth Club. I'm Dr. Lucy Kalanithi. I'm a clinical associate professor of medicine at the Stanford University School of Medicine and host of a new podcast called Gravity about what becomes possible when we think of hardships differently. Thank you for supporting the Commonwealth Club as they continue to host virtual events. Visit commonwealthclub.org to learn more about membership or support the club right now with a tax deductible gift by clicking the blue donate button on your screen. It's my pleasure to introduce my friend, Dr. Jesse Gold, for this program. Dr. Gold is an assistant professor of psychiatry at Washington University in St. Louis School of Medicine and its director of wellness, engagement, and outreach. As an academic psychiatrist, Dr. Gold specializes in treating college students and fellow healthcare workers, two of the groups most traumatized by the pandemic. She's also a writer and leader praised nationally for illuminating the mental health impacts of the pandemic and advocating against stigma. She combines storytelling, research, personal vulnerability, and humor. Today's program is the new normal, emotions as we emerge from the pandemic. So with that, I'm so glad to welcome Dr. Jesse Gold. Hello. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for doing this together. Um, And just a reminder to the audience, uh, please submit questions in the chat because we'll be taking your questions as the program goes along. Um, Jesse, is it fine if I call you Jesse? Yeah, it's totally fine. Um, I'm sure that so many people are curious to hear from you about this past year through your eyes. And um, obviously, you are a frontline healthcare worker. Uh, as a psychiatrist, you were on the front lines of mental health this year. So could you share with us um, what kinds of issues your own patients have brought to you this year? Yeah, this year's been really interesting. I mean, I think from the beginning, it was pretty clear that we were going to have more patients and it was going to be busier. Like right up front, I think people were really dealing with like the shock of the pandemic and trying to deal with taking care of their families and trying to make sure everything was, you know, organized and getting to mental health tends to be a little bit further down the like Maslach hierarchy of needs of things. And so I think right, right, right at the beginning, we kind of had a lull. And then all of a sudden it was like, I'm really anxious. This is not ending in a month. A lot of uncertainty. So uncertainty is pretty much a breeding ground for all things anxiety. And then the longer it's gone on, I think more on the depression side of things, in part because of social isolation, in part because of people sort of, you know, it, it the longer it goes on, the more stressors you compile, the more things that you're dealing with. And I think that becomes harder for people with all of the changes. And so we've definitely seen more depression depression over time. I think an increase in substances is a way to cope, mostly alcohol, at least from what people tell me, um, a little bit on the marijuana side as well. And then I think, um, you know, eating disorders in the same realm sort of as a way of coping or a way of, um, you know, exhibiting control in some capacity or lack of control, I would say. Um, And I think, you know, you mentioned one of my main populations is healthcare workers. So I'd be remiss not to say trauma. I think, you know, as healthcare workers, especially, but, you know, the entire population has just been, uh, you know, bombarded with all things trauma this year. And I think healthcare workers in particular, Um, Once they had time to sort of realize what they were experiencing, which can be a bit harder in healthcare workers because of stigma, because of really putting other people before themselves. Um, Once they really had time to do that, I think we're much more aware that it was going to be a long term impact and was more on the sort of, I guess, right away would be called acute stress disorder, but PTSD kind of spectrum of things where, you know, people are having trouble sleeping or more activated or feeling like, you know, whatever they saw at work was particularly being re-experienced or, you know, really contributing to their overall mental well-being. That's so interesting what you say about how 
on top of stressors, generally just the pure fact of uncertainty or loss of control is its own stressor. Um, and then it sounds like you saw a huge variety of reactions to that. Um, was there anything that surprised you? I mean, other than everything, but um, <laughs> sort of that really did surprise you um, as things went along. Um, in terms of people's reactions, I mean, I think I could have predicted, I have a lot of population, I see a lot of populations that at baseline have a really challenging mental health. So, you know, I don't think we talk about it enough, but I'm sure, you know, like healthcare workers have, you know, among the highest rates of suicide of any profession and physicians, our depression rates are astronomical, honestly, like in the 28% for physicians and residents, it's quite high. I mean, for the most part, it's much more in the like single digits. So we aren't starting with a super good baseline. So I could have predicted that anything would have made that worse. And same with college students have a much like higher mental health stress baseline. But, um, you know, in terms of things that actually surprised me about it, I would probably say most of it has been my own reaction and my own experience with it at the same time, because, you know, I think for the most part, when we learn mental health, we learn like how to you know, experience what other people are experiencing in session or, or with our patients, but not really take it on ourselves, even if for some reason, whatever the story is, does remind us of ourselves. But because of the pandemic, we're like very actively going through the same stressors as our patients. So you don't have as much ability to put up a boundary or put up a barrier and say like, well, that was just one person today and the rest of the week will be fine. That one person reminded me of me or my family member or whatever, but I'll be fine. I just need a break. It's like every single session, every single day. And at the same time as you're like, you know, me experiencing anxiety or whatever else burnout, especially over the time. And that becomes a lot harder. Um, it's so interesting. Um, it must've been strange to be a psychiatrist and therapist. Cause like you say, I think you're sort of describing the fact of collective trauma of everyone moving through various traumas at the same time. And then you are in the public sphere talking about that too. So, um, could you talk about what collective trauma is and sort of how you've come to assess that this year? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely very unique. It's a kind of thing where everybody goes through at least something at the same time, which leads to you having some sort of common baseline of experience of hardship, right? So a lot of times when we think about that, there's like war as experiences of that. There's previous pandemics as experiences of that. But this one's particularly unique in the length of time it has gone on in the you know way that it's affected the whole world, in the way that it has affected specific populations more acutely than others and things like that. So, you know, you have this sort of collective experience, but I think on an individual level, everybody has had really different stressors and really different experiences with it, which makes it really hard, to be honest. I think it's one of the harder things that people will notice when life, life is reopening and they're interacting with people is that you don't actually know what someone's been through and you don't actually know what the pandemic has been like for them. And so, you know, either assuming that everything's great or assume, assuming everything is really hard, either way is wrong, really, because you don't really know what anybody has experienced. So I think this experience of collective trauma has been like both a you know, universal thing, but on the individual level, there's been so many little things for different people or even bigger things for different people, which make this experience just very different, I would say. I don't know. How have you experienced that in your own like sphere of people? Yeah. I mean, I guess the reaction I'm having to you saying that is just, um, there's some quote, I don't know who you, who said it, but it's something like, there's no one you couldn't love when you know their story. And, um, you know, it's like you go to the grocery store and people are in a rush or someone's not wearing a mask or someone, you know, it's like, I have a deaf friend for whom the pandemic has been immensely isolating because 
everyone's faces are covered. And obviously she, she interacts with people actually by reading lips for the most part, but then she can't see expressions. She has had a lot of discrimination in settings everywhere from doctor's offices to grocery stores because people are scared to take off their masks with her, but she needs them to. And so that's an example, or, you know, as you're going through the grocery store, it's like this person lost a job, this person lost a family member. Um, there was a New York times essay where someone described the only physical contact they had had in three months was getting change, um, coins given back to them at the grocery store. And they brush the hand of the person giving them the change or someone else who was single and isolated at home was like pushing against the wall to sort of experience different types of physical stimulation. And then obviously, um, there's many other forms of trauma here and around the world. So. I mean, I think it's just, um, you know, I'm not sure there's a point to suffering in the world generally, but I think one of the things suffering does is connect everybody. And so, um, you know, like, how do we process that? Um, and I think one of the things that, um, going through a tra collective trauma does, um, is like, you know, crack open our hearts a little bit to seeing, um, what other people are going through. And I think it's been so interesting to see, and you are among these people where you're telling a story on CNN and then you get tears in your eyes, right. Or we've seen reporters breaking down into tears or people just sharing really vulnerable stories. And I think, um, in a way that's kind of a beautiful thing about the pandemic, um, during such a hard time. I don't know. It's sort of, I guess maybe my reaction is just like, it is all things at once, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that, you know, I I've had that experience too, as like a psychiatrist, I like to think I can see anybody who's experiencing anything, even if I, you know, don't have the same life experiences or don't have the same beliefs. And so I think it, I do approach things from that. Like, if you understood people's story, you would understand them and where they're coming from. And I try really hard to do that with lots of things, including like trolls on social media, you know, up to that level, because I do think for me, like, I can understand how someone can get drawn to a trap of certain articles because they go down a rabbit hole because they lost their job and they're looking for the news that most you know, equates with their current emotional state. And I think I can see that and understand that it can be hard when that plays out like on a global scale for people and that can be dangerous for people. But I think like in my office on a one-on-one -on -one setting, like I can understand that enough to have a conversation or to be able to sort of navigate that and not completely disrespect the people. And I'm a big believer in like just actually having those conversations instead of like, you know, blocking them off and causing big partitions between things because the conversations do lead to like, you know, some understanding of empathy and that collective trauma feeling where like, even if what you experience is different, like you are still a human who experienced something and it was probably hard. And that makes it easier to understand like, hardship in other people, even if it's very different from your own. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a lesson there. I mean, even just in what we know about changing opinions, um, you know, like listening and storytelling is a huge part of it. I've heard you often say like, you know, it's, it's something like, tell me if this is right, but, um, like opinions are not always valid, but feelings are always valid. Um, uh, can you say more about that if you have anything more to say? Cause that's, yeah, I mean, I, that's how I deal with things I don't agree with, to be honest. Like there's a lot of things that, you know, out like, un, like outside of even my professional realm, like in my personal realm of things that, you know, when people do things or, you know, put people in danger or like are making vaccine rates go up by not, you know, or like not um, getting the vaccine because of, beliefs that I might not agree with these sorts of things. I think that for me to, you know, really kind of come at that and understand things, it's always like, well, I might not understand like your exact opinion or where you're coming from with that opinion, but your like feelings behind them are quite strong and you are angry or you're sad or you're mad or whatever. And all of that comes from something. And no matter what, like you can't tell people they don't feel things, I think. And that's when when experiences become extra hard for people or people have 
problems interacting in families or people have problems interacting, you know, with each other, um, especially people who've experienced trauma. It's this sort of like, well, you don't have the right to that feeling or you shouldn't feel like that anymore or that's not how you should be responding to that. And I think that has happened a good amount in the pandemic because people kind of compare traumas and they say like, well, I didn't lose somebody, but, you know, my college was postponed and I'm not doing college the same way. And that really affected me. But because everybody keeps telling me it doesn't count, then I have this added layer of like, you know, pressure and validation of what I'm experiencing. And really like that doesn't help, um, you know, and I, I would imagine that that comes up sometimes too, just based on your like, life narrative that it can be hard for people to like, you know, where they're like, well, my husband didn't have cancer and die, you know? So I think that it can be this thing where people feel like they can't talk about certain things because it's not the same as if you wouldn't understand pain just because it's pain, you know? Absolutely. Um, and just for background for people. Um, I lost my husband to cancer six years ago. He was a neurosurgeon and writer who died of lung cancer. He was 36. Um, he wrote the memoir when breath becomes air. And then I did a book tour, um, talking with a lot of people about hardship and you're absolutely right. So many people have come up to me and said like, well, this doesn't compare to what you've been through, but can I share such and such a thing? And it does always strike me as so, um, like, unnecessary, right? Not that I like, it's just the um, writer and podcast host, Nora McInerney talks about the grief Olympics. And she's like, there's no winning the grief Olympics and everyone's gone through something hard. And it's like, I have a seven-year-old daughter and, you know, if, if her, I mean, she's dealing with various things, just like every person. And she's learning to grow up having lost her dad, but in general, like the hardest thing that might happen to her is that her ice cream cone falls on the ground. Right. And she like sobs and sobs. And it's not like, that's not really hard for her. Um, you know, I don't mean to give a trivial example. I actually mean it to be sort of a real example of like, whatever you're going through is really hard to you. Um, and it matters. Um, yeah. Or the hardest thing could, you've ever been through. Or sure. Totally. Too. Yeah. Right. And it's like, yeah, absolutely. Um, could you talk about, so obviously, um, people are walking around with a lot of feelings. And um, what do you tell either your clients or people who contact you on social media or whatever it might be? Um, And by the way, your like empathy for (laughs) Twitter trolls is like a whole new level of uh, emotional enlightenment. So um, (laughs) what do you tell people um, in terms of practical tools for how to figure out how to cope with emotion and the various tools that are available to help people do that when, when they feel overwhelmed? we're gonna feel overwhelmed. So I think that's point one, which is to say that like in a time like this, you should have feelings like point me to someone who has zero feelings about this. And I would be like completely shocked and mostly just think they're in denial. Um, Anybody I have had, even patients who have really done well in the pandemic because they had social anxiety and they get to not see people in every experience of their life and it's been easier for them, still have reactions to it, right? Still have feelings about it. It's an unprecedented time to use the word that people tend to use a lot, but it'd be impossible to not have feelings about it. So I think the first thing is like, you should have feelings and you should give yourself time to like, and space to have them, which we don't tend to do, you know, as like women, especially, but, you know, caregivers, healthcare workers, if you're sort of like powering through to deal with other people to work, to do, go back to work and get set up at work and do your work, whatever, you kind of put your head down and don't think of how, feelings and emotions interact and you don't think about yourself in the equation. So like taking time to be like, wait, how am I feeling? And actually, you know, approaching that as something you need to be doing every day and, you know, not judging the answer and letting the answer exist because there really aren't, as my own therapist would say, there aren't good and bad feelings. They're just feelings. And so like, qualifying them as like, well, I shouldn't be feeling that or that that's bad. I shouldn't have said that is not helpful, really. I mean, it doesn't it just adds a a layer of, you know, self judgment, which we do anyway. (laughs) So I think, you know, giving yourself space and time for that, not judging them, um, you know, depending on how they are and how much they're affecting you, like then kind of approaching it from a coping skills kind of level, which is to say, like, 
I feel this way. When I feel this way, uh, it can sometimes help for me to take a bath. It can sometimes help for me to journal. It can sometimes help for me to like call a friend and whatever that is, like sort of having an awareness of the tools and things that can help you in those times can then take that dealing with feelings to sort of the next level, which is like managing them and coping with them and, you know, having feelings and them not getting in the way, but being part of like the quilts of your life. Right. Could you talk about, so I love that you just mentioned your own therapist. Um, and obviously you are a psychiatrist who is also in therapy yourself. Could you talk about the role of therapy here? And maybe for somebody who is attending or listening, who is considering therapy, but has never done it. And then like, who might it be helpful for? And um, maybe in addition, um, how people could access therapy if there's um, limited access or financial issue, et cetera, if you have any advice about that. Okay. If I forget any of those so all questions, the myriad barriers. if I yeah. forget any of those questions, prompt up. me, but I, I'm going to try. So therapy for me. So I have gone to therapy since college, um, has been helpful at different stages of my life for different reasons. Um, I grew up in a family with a psychiatrist, um, but still felt very achievement oriented and didn't really want to deal with my own feelings for much of college until it really got to a point where I sort of was like, I need to be dealing with this and doing something about this. And it actually does interfere with my relationships or my school, or there's like something I need to talk out here. So, you know, I'm not one to say like, well, she's in mental health. So obviously she's a supporter of mental health and like therapy. I think it did take some convincing for me as like a way to help me when I was younger. Um, and I think what it does is, you know, at different stages of my life probably has done different things, but sort of understanding your reactions and why you're having them, understanding patterns in your life in terms of like feelings and thoughts and behaviors, um, understanding like kind of the entire quilted narrative of your life in some capacity and sort of understanding like the way that different things in your past interact with, you know, things that are in your present or, you know, things that you want in the future and, you know, whatever, and kind of having a big global sense of you. Um, one of the benefits to me of a therapist is that like they're a neutral party and they're, you know, Per, their purpose is not like ever to take sides or to feel burdened by you in any capacity. And so when you feel like, you know, you have a lot going on and you want to talk to someone, but like you are kind of sick of doing that to your friends and family or kind of know that that maybe is not the right outlet anymore, or maybe it's heavy stuff that you're not quite ready to talk to your friends and family about, like having someone who can listen and help you navigate that and help you learn to express that stuff can be a, a big um, benefit, I think, um, you know, for some people, even just learning words for feelings can be part of what therapy can do. I think it, it can sound silly, but for the most part, when you ask people like how they are, they say, okay, or fine. And neither are actually feelings <laughs> and, um, you know, trying to get to the, the core of like, when you are checking in with yourself, what are feelings and why am I feeling them? And like, why do I not like being mad? And why did I judge that feeling, um, can be a good, um, right, or like, why know, am I mad? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, it can definitely be a good, um, you know, use of therapy, I think people definitely turn to it when they're in an acute kind of crisis of something. Um, and that doesn't always need to be the case. I think it can also help you like be a better employee, be a better spouse, be a better partner, be a better friend um, in your life when you might not be in like the hardest, lowest point of your life as well. Um, and it can lead to sort of you know, help you navigate life more successfully in some capacity. Um, at least I think so. I think it's hard for people to think about telling somebody like all of their stories and people that they don't know. But I think that's sort of the beauty in it is that you can take the time to do that and have the space for yourself every week and have somebody who can listen. Um, and then your question about access. <laughs> I mean, if I could tell you all the problems with the mental health system, I would take this whole podcast, but um, if that probably even longer, I mean, it is a mess. It was a mess before the pandemic. 
um, with this increase in need. You know, if you look at CDC data, like kind of on average, it's about 40, oh, around 40% of people having anxiety and depression symptoms. Assuming not every one of those people is going to get treatment, that's still a lot more people and we don't have enough providers for that. And it can feel very frustrating to reach out for help, especially the first time and have people say like, I have a wait list or I don't have time for you. Or like, there's not a therapist that does that in this community, or it's not covered by your insurance or all of these things that probably people who have never interacted with the mental health system didn't realize existed until they tried to interact Mm -hmm. with it. So I would say, you know, be patient would be one thing I'd say with that is like, it can be super frustrating because it is super frustrating, but you know, that part of it is not something that necessarily is changing tomorrow. Um, but you can get there, just take some time. I think, you know, a good resource for all things therapy is usually something like psychology today, just sort of like a Facebook of therapists and you can search by your zip code and like where your are insur- and your insurance and get like a, you know, blurb about people and see how you fit and what if you like them and write them from there. They're they're actually up to date usually, so they shouldn't be on there if they're full. Um, So that can help. I think it's one of the places that I would probably send most people in those circumstances. But I would say, like, without a doubt, I completely agree that there are so many things that need fixing. It's half of the reason, probably more of why I do what I do and why I speak on platforms like this was like, because people do need to realize there are these things that are wrong and they only get fixed through advocacy and policy change, really. We're getting an audience question from somebody who says, um, virtual therapy versus in-person, what are some of the pros and cons? It's a good question. I I don't know how much you've, I'm trying to think how much you've heard me rant about this, Lucy, but, um, you know, for me, I'm excited. (laughs) I think that, you know, there are, I would say pluses and minuses from the patient and provider standpoint. But if, you know, the most logical plus of virtual therapy is access, right? Is people can go when they want much more easily because you can go like in the middle of an office day, like step out for lunch, sit in your car, which 95% of my patients do and get on the office visit and not feel like you also have to drive and park and get there and commute and have that be part of, you know, what you're missing of your day, which makes it a lot harder for something you're supposed to do weekly, right? And so big bonus is like access and accessibility in terms of like, you know, getting to appointments, but also like, you know, distance from like, you can see more therapists if you're in a place that maybe is like, doesn't have the therapist you're looking for, like, you want a therapist of color, and there isn't a therapist of color in your particular area, you can have more likely to get access through, you know, doing something virtual, because they can you know, not have the distance barriers themselves either. I think that is definitely a thing. I think some people will tell you they actually like having like the safety of being in their own home um, while they're doing it. And that can be like, you know, this is my safe space. It's not someone else's safe space and therefore it's good for me. But on the flip side, I would say, um, you know, at home, people have a lot of more distractions. A lot of the people that they um, are talking about are often in the house. And so, you know, people call when they're driving, people call in their car, there's not a lot of like really comfortable spaces where people feel like they're really alone. And so that's one of the benefits of the office. I would argue the benefit of the office is I feel personally more connected to patients and I do feel more connected to my personal therapist that way. Um, I think there's a different sense of like connection in person. I think people can maybe notice that in having to do Zoom for meetings for their whole year or even a friend. Right. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah, It just feels different. And so I I mean, I think if it's the only thing you've ever done, like research would say it, it, it is the same, you know, apples to apples. But I do think that there's a different level of connection that I feel having started with my therapist before the pandemic and then gone into the pandemic virtually with her, as opposed to just meeting her over the pandemic. Um, As a provider, I think it's easier to burn out over virtual therapy um, because it's just like less interactive. You're not like getting up and going to the waiting room. You're not like staring at a person in front of you. It's just the computer 
better. Um, and I'd also argue as a provider, I'm a little bit less able to like actually see like subtle body cues and things like that. And so like, I can see your face, but like, you know, until I like do something with my hands, you can't see my hands. Like you can't really see me like shift about things and whatever. And I think we pay attention to like, you know, people getting uncomfortable with certain topics or why they might shift, um, you know, their body when certain things are brought up and kind of understand the body's relationship to emotion in a lot of ways and not having that can be um, a little bit harder for me, I think, to do my job um, in probably that reflects on the ability for like a patient to feel that same, you know, awareness from me. Hmm. Um, we're getting a lot of questions about return to the workplace for people who've been working from home and, um, two different versions. Um, maybe I'll ask this one first, um, for people who've been working from home, it's obviously a big adjustment to be contemplating going back, um, both pluses and minuses, um, for people who will be adjusting to that, um, particularly if they're feeling nervous, anxious, worried, um, what advice do you have um, for those folks? Yeah, like the number one thing for me for that is like nobody said you had to jump into the deep end right away or like do things like sort of the fear factor way where if you're nervous or anxious, you do everything all at once and there's like, you know, 200 spiders in a tank. You know, for me, it's like if you're afraid about going back for some reason or something's hard, it's like how can you make that like a, do something to get there slower? Like, is there a way that you can ease yourself back in? Are there, you know, social activities you could start to get engaged with that would fake, like make you feel more comfortable around people slow enough that you could then go back to the workplace and feel okay with how that's set up. Um, is it possible to not go like every day of the week all at once? And maybe that's an option in your workplace. Maybe it's not. Um, but having, you know, thoughts about how to, you know, not do it all at once and judge yourself for not being able to do it all at once, I think it's important. It's going to be anxiety provoking and, and it's going to feel different, but, you know, giving yourself the grace and ability to sort of stepwise get there, I think is part of the, you know, beauty of it, but hardship of it too. And the second thing would be like, nobody said you had to get rid of everything you liked about being home either. <laughs> so I think one of the things that, you know, I think was best about the pandemic was like, an, you get an evaluation of values and like things that really matter to you and things that have been, you know, what brings you joy. And if, you know, coming home every single day and like being there for dinner with your family is the most important thing for you. And you realize that over the pandemic, you're going to have to figure out a way to prioritize that in your work day. If that's, you know, it's just like, it's hard, but you might have to change the way you were doing things before, but we just changed everything we were doing before. So you can change one thing pretty easily if you think about it. And I think people are really afraid that they have to like get rid of everything they started doing and started liking. And I don't really think that's the case. I do think work you know, as it stands can be a little less flexible, but, um, you know, I think bosses are aware that this is going to be an adjustment and there's hybrid thought to it and how emotions play into it is discussed, at least in my workplace and what I do in my job. So I do think people are thinking about it. The follow-up question is about that, which is for somebody who is a boss in a workplace or an advocate or an organizational leader um, what types of things should employers do to help ensure the mental health of employees as they come back? Super good question. And probably what people are trying to make me do every single day from now until then is figure out how to make it easier for people to adjust back. Cause I see like do work on the university side and the hospital side. And there's like kind of a lot of different people adjusting back to different roles. But I think you know, the first thing is like your communication really, really matters. Like what you say in an email is going to be scrutinized like crazy. So like if you just write like something quickly and kind of offhand acknowledge the pandemic and don't say that you're aware that the transition's hard for people and don't look like you're expressing any empathy, people just feel like, oh good, like I'm just a worker bee. I'm just back here and all I do is this. So I think it's really important to think about the language that you use, the words you use in emails, the way that you speak to your employees about the experience 
experience, the way that you humanize yourself and express some level of vulnerability. Like, I think, again, one of the good things about the pandemic is because it did happen to everyone, there is a normalization of sort of that hierarchical, I'm your boss, you're my employee level. And I think there are a lot of things we can relate to each other about the challenges and the mental health challenges, especially of the pandemic and being able to say like, listen, like this was hard for me because of X, Y, Z, like, what was it like for you? And like setting the tone from high up that that's acceptable to ask those questions and be talking about those things and that you're not expecting people to give you a full self-disclosure of all of their mental health history and everything they're going through, but, you know, just expressions of feelings in the workplace, expressions of challenges in the workplace, like whatever that looks like to you, I think is important from above. And then the second or the other big, you know, area would be like a flexibility um, in, you know, what people are expected to come back and do what that model might look like. Could it look different for different people? Does everybody need a one size fits all model of everything? And or did the pandemic teach us that's not helpful? Um, you know, and really being aware that there, when people say like, they did like certain things for certain reasons, they're probably not lying to you. I have this like, you know, uh, it's come up more than once about like students saying they have anxiety or depression when they don't to like get out of tests and things like that. And like the students saying that to get out of tests, they probably have something else they're struggling with. But on top of that, like you're, you know, they're not, most people have been through something that's challenging and like giving space for it and telling them like they're allowed to take breaks or they're allowed to take vacation days and they're allowed to work from home sometimes. And what that looks like is, you know, you still value them and you still understand that you'd rather them take one day off up front than a month or two of disability in the future, I think is really key. Um. Could you talk a little bit more about um, structural changes that you see needed generally Um, and maybe sort of what you've seen as a psychiatrist, maybe some stories you could tell um, that have taught you about that, not just in mental health, but either in healthcare or kind of society broadly. And I think um, what you just said about the need for flexibility in professional settings, sick days, all of that kind of thing. Um, Could you just talk about... um, structural issues that are impacting people's mental health or even physical health? Yeah, I mean, I think a really good example to me is like everything that Naomi Osaka has been talking about, because, you know, she just wrote this piece in time about her experience. And it was like, you know, if I can't express, well, if I'm expected to tell you like my entire mental health history for you to believe me, like imagine what it's like for everybody else. So I think that there is this bar of like expectation that mental health is like, you know, because you can't see my broken leg, like that I'm kind of like saying, I just don't want to go to work, but having more of a conceptual understanding that like people can suffer and it can make them not go to work. And that is valid. And I think that she sort of sets the stage for being able to say that um, on a global level. I think I've had patients that feel like they can't bring up like mental health needs to superiors because they just don't think it's allowed or they just don't think it's like the environment that tolerates it or is open. And then on the flip side, I'll see their like boss and their bosses will say like, I don't understand why that person quit. Like I believe in, you know, that stuff. And I don't know why they didn't just come talk to me or why they needed to, you know, end up taking time off because of this. Like, I think we could have, you know, come to some sort of better understanding if we could have talked about some of this stuff. And I think there is just this like complete miscommunication on a lot of sides, which is like, you know, if you're somebody who's fine with it and you like understand mental health and you're a person people can approach, you are going to have to start sending up some sort of signals that that's true. And I think that's important in a structure of a, you know, employment is a super important in healthcare with like so much hierarchy and the afraid, being afraid to approach someone of a different level than you. But if you're a person who's much more like level about these experiences, even your own experiences, I think people feel a lot safer like coming to you. And I think if people come to you earlier, you're much more likely to get them in a preventive stage or like a little earlier stage than you can probably get them like missing a lot less work. I also think that you're much more likely to you know, forge a better communication pathway for the future and any other things that might come up. And that can make a 
you know, a, a pretty big difference. Um, you know, I also think a lot about like how we burn out in the structures of our work day and breaks and, you know, work-life balance and stuff like that. And I feel like it was Iceland. There's like a study about four day work weeks. And I think, and like how people, you know, over there, like, you know, they did the study of four day work weeks and people were a lot better. And I get it because I think we would never think of doing that. But if someone imposed it, you're like, oh, it's there. Right. Like better work, work, less attrition. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Could you talk about how you intentionally make yourself someone who's modeling some of these um, values and concepts? Because I know you're very intentional about making yourself an approachable person person and using your own story to reduce stigma. So um, just if other leaders want to emulate that, um, some specifics from you. Yeah, definitely. And then I actually, when I relay that same question to you, because I actually think it's the same, but um, you know, for me, it's been like, as I've gotten older and as I've gotten, you know, more comfortable with things like social media and my level of being authentic and vulnerable in things like writing, I've become a lot more able to talk about like my own experiences or my current own experiences and how they inform like how I'm thinking or why it might be hard for someone else or why this is mentally like challenging for people. And, um, I think it's been really important to me as, as I felt like less in that trapped, like hierarchy, I can't talk about this stuff, or that's not medicine to talk about this stuff. Once I could get past that and be better able to say like, listen, like, this is hard. Like, this is what I'm struggling with. Or, you know, um, this experience in particular that I have where like, you know, all my friends are calling and I don't want to pick up the phone because I can't deal with anybody else's problems because I'm already dealing with like everybody's problems in my job and like ignoring my friends and my friends thinking that there's something wrong with me. Right. So there's like, you know, something as simple, I mean, really as simple as that really, I think like relates to a lot of people's experiences. And sometimes when I say things, I don't realize how much that's true. And then I'll say it on like social or I'll write about it and like seeing the degree of resonation of something that feels like Mm kind of obvious, I think is also really important. Like once I said like, oh, I just slept the entire day on a Saturday on social and like people were like, oh my God, like that's allowed. Like, I didn't know that was, that's happening to Mm, you too. Like, thank you for writing that. yeah, Yeah. Like I didn't know that like, that didn't mean I was sick or that didn't mean something's wrong with me. And then somebody wrote like, my mom asked me like when I was sleeping, if something was wrong. And I said, Dr. Gold said I'm allowed to sleep on weekends, you know? And I think for me, like even that is just, you know, powerful in that, like it's something simple. I didn't say like, here's what I talk about in therapy. And I don't, I've never said that. Nobody knows what I talk about in therapy. They know the things I want to tell, right? Nobody's forcing you to tell your entire trauma story to the like employees. Right. But I think you can resonate and you can help people with some of these like kind of day-to-day things that so many people are struggling with that maybe for you are particularly hard because of a trauma you experienced or because of your history of anxiety or depression or whatever. And if you choose to talk about that, cool. If you don't like you still understand like that baseline level of what everyone else is going through and being able to express that and say like, I'm a safe place, like I'm a safe place for that. Like I'm someone you can come to for that. I'm somebody who thinks about that. I think for me on social, I also, if I ever see other people be um, particularly emotionally vulnerable or, you know, tell their story in some capacity, I tend to try to validate it because I can't imagine like what it's like to tell a story or something really hard to like the ether and not know how it's going to be responded to. And also like not know, like if you're going to get negative responses, right? So it's always nice to know that like someone saw it and someone gets it and someone validated that in the right way. (laughs) So whenever I see Mm -hmm. that, I try really hard to be like, uh, aware and, and, and encouraging and, and validating of that choice for people. Um, and so, I mean, that's kind of how I think about it in some kind of like global level, but, um, you know, it's really interesting. I feel like I was supposed to, like, I heard you talk when I was at Stanford in residency at this like wellness thing about your, for med students where I was a, like mm-hmm. a resident, but I was like a faculty member in this thing. And I think you also, you know, talk about, your struggles where you feel like talking about it openly and where you can, and it's 
probably some of your stuff you <laughs> didn't really get a choice of talking about, which is like a whole nother level of challenging, I think, for people. Um, but I wonder how you also approach that. Yeah. Um, um, and I think I actually agree with what you just said, which is um, you do have a choice what you talk about, right? And um, I liked what you said about how um, as long as you're authentic in what you do share, that's authenticity. You don't have to feel um, um, like pressured to share more than you would want to at a given time. And I think um, I did, um, I think what you're referring to is I did a kind of a welcome talk for um, incoming health profession students, physician, um, physician assistant students and medical students um, at Stanford. And in it, I mentioned having had an episode of depression and residency and burnout and the intertwining of those two things and um, sort of some of the issues you've described, accessing help or feeling very worried about stigma. And um, just as a side note, your advocacy includes um, decoupling mental health support from licensing questions and licensing um uh, there's a lot of sort of silencing of mental health in healthcare, the same way that there is in airline pilots and a number of various professions where you worry that if you access mental health care, um, your license or job will be at stake, which is sort of the opposite of what you might expect um, and what's really needed for a healthy, safe workforce. Um, so, so ultimately at this event for students, I was 10 years out from training and sort of shared the details of this experience because I was hoping that um, someone who was listening to it um, might feel emboldened or validated by it and that it would help change the culture. You know, um, like you say, when you get to a point where you feel more safe in your, um, in your job standing, I think there's a, um, um, it feels like a responsibility in some ways. And I think I'm particularly respectful of people who are earlier in their training or careers like Dr. Justin Bullock, who are sharing in real time um, what they're going through, because I think that's a whole new level of bravery. Um, and that's something that's inspired me too. And I know you as well. So, um, uh, but yeah, I think I, I relate to the goals that you have and um, want to keep working on that. Yeah, you're right. Um, I mean, it does shake up the system a lot to think like earlier while you're actively experiencing it, like, do you feel safe enough to share it? Um, you know, there are some things that I felt like I could share when I was in training. And I think medical school was always like, is this experience was related to med school and it was hard. And so I could share it, but I never really went so deep into talking about my own therapy or my own personal experiences in that way. And I think that has come over time in, in part, my own comfort with my own story and, um, my own role at being someone who can model that. Um, but I think it's so inspiring to see the young younger <laughs> group sort of say, why do I have to wait? And like, I can, you know, talk about this now. Right. And it's, it's inspiring also to see, um, the response to that as there has been to your work just shows how hungry people are, um, for that culture change. Um, um, let me ask a couple of audience questions. So, um, okay, here's a good one. Um, uh, do you have any advice for anyone thinking in general about entering the medical profession or applying to medical school? And I think, um, I wish I had the attribution of the physician who just posted it, but there was, I'm going to add, um, a comment on this, which is, um, there's a intern or resident who is a young queer physician who tweeted something recently and said, if you are somebody who's wondering, am I the type of person um, who could become a doctor um, or should become a doctor. And you have reasons for thinking that maybe you're not. Um, this person tweeted, that probably means you're exactly what our profession needs. And I wonder what your reaction to that would be. And then, in, you know, to this um, potential healthcare worker who's thinking about applying. Yeah, um, I completely agree with that statement. I think one of the things we do a disservice to in medicine, in particular, becoming a physician is you have to decide so early that that's what you want to do. Even if you take time off or you have a little bit of an alternative path, you're still very much considering medicine. You know, I took a year off after college and I thought I was like doing the best thing in the world. And, you know, at the same time was applying to med school the whole time. So I clearly hadn't changed my mind, even though I was like 
experimenting to figure out if I wanted to do medicine. Right. And I think, you know, having the time to actually say like, this is hard. Like, do I want to do this? Why do I want to do this? What about this do I like? And like, who am I doing this for is a big question and is worth like, uh, you know, assessing and making sure you're doing it for you and not for whatever noise in the background there is growing up in a culture that prioritizes certain professions, growing up in a household that prioritizes certain professions, believing that if you're good at science, you have to be a doctor, whatever that is, like, you know, having an awareness of saying, like, where, where do I fit in this picture? And, and, and say, I don't know, say this is hard, say you don't want to do it, take time off, break the like, you know, you know, train of having to keep going and going. I think that's really important. I think if you're applying, and you like, I would say, try your hardest to stay as authentic to yourself as you can. There are going to be lots of ways that they try to change you and tell you not to do that. But for me, like, I don't want to be somewhere that doesn't want me to be me. And I think, you know, people always ask me things like, should I write about my mental health stuff on an application or, you know, whatever. And for me, it's like, I mean, I don't want to tell you what to do. And I don't want to tell you it's not going to affect you getting into like a surgical residency program or something. But at the same point, I'd rather be in the surgical residency program that like when I come in and have written mental health stuff on my application, they give me a high five and say that was awesome, as opposed to like, why did you do that? That was horrible and unprofessional because you're still that person, even if you're trying to hide it within the context of the culture. So I think it is important to realize that like, yes, there are these like cultural pressures, but at the same point, you might find places that you might feel more at home. Um, I'm trying to figure out what direction I want to go in. Um, <laughs> could you, maybe I'll just ask you this. What do you wish that everyone knew um, either individually or culturally about mental health and emotions? Oh, that's a good one. I mean, I think that I wish that people knew that they well, that they're not a weakness and that, you know, having mental health struggles are, you know, just the same and just as valid as having physical health struggles. In fact, the brain and body are so intimately connected that we can only really blame insurance companies for the fact that we have separated them so much in our lives and the way that we think about things and, you know, the way that medicine is set up it has nothing to do with the fact that everything you are feeling as something about your brain and everything that you're experiencing physically is probably something you're feeling emotionally and, you know, having an awareness that like, being able to identify that and say like, this is what I'm struggling with, or this is hard, or, you know, I do need help is, is more of a strength than anything. And I think we don't tend to do that. And we tend to say like, well, there's something wrong with me because everyone has been through the pandemic and they seem fine. Or, you know, everyone's a healthcare worker on the front line, but there's something particularly hard about this experience for me. But that doesn't mean you are weak. That means you're aware, you know, and I think that that's how I think about it. Um, And that's what I would hope that people would see over time is that they're really the same, but that they make you stronger person to be aware of sort of the interconnection and interplay between them. I don't know. What do you think? I mean, I don't know. I go back to that idea of all feelings are valid. And I also sort of, as a person who's gone through mental health struggles and, gone through really intense grief. I kind of feel, I don't know how exactly to explain this in like smart words, but I essentially feel like the only way through is through. And there's like, in my experience, I have like a certain amount of feelings that I'm just going to have to feel somehow, like they will come out somehow, you know? And so I think everybody has a different way of processing or getting at those. Like for me, I read a lot. I read poetry. I'm a talker. So I talk. Um, and you know, some people will like watch a TV show that they know is going to make them cry because they need to feel some feelings, you know, or, um, I don't know. I, I think that's one of the things I've kind of learned over time. Um, uh, and then I think, you know, part of why, um, I love reading in poetry and you have a poem that you recommended that I'm actually going to read at the closing in a little while is sometimes it just is so validating to have your own experience reflected back to you without even any problem solving or advice or anything, but just to know that other people have gone through the same thing. I think when my late husband died, 
one of the poems I loved the most was written by an Elizabethan poet um, from like, you know, literally 500 years ago or centuries ago. And this person going through the exact same feelings that I felt visiting a grave was one of the most comforting things there was. And so, um, I yeah, think those that's com- why those people forget. To mind. People forget, like, that's a benefit of therapy, right? Is like having someone reflect something mm-hmm. back to you without judgment or without, you right, know, like, any this sort is of a thing. Yeah, like, by the way, <laughs> right? you know, that sounds like that wouldn't have been like the easiest childhood or easiest experience. And you're like, right. wait, what do you mean? I don't understand. Like, why right. would that be? You know, and sometimes it's just you haven't paused to think about it. I mean, I, I've told you, but I mean, I didn't know I was burnt out over the pandemic until my therapist told me I was burnt out. And I, I let, and you're talks. a national expert on burnout. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do these talks all the time, right? I'm very aware of the definition and symptoms and the way that you perceive this stuff. But I, at the same time, sometimes you're so concentrated on like the things you're doing, the ways to help people. For me, it was like, if I stop, like somebody's going to, you know, people need me, right? I'm, I'm holding up a lot of people's emotions and I'm trying to really keep doing this. And I'm not a frontline worker on the front lines of the ER. I'm a, that's, this is the way I can give back. And I sort of just, you know, fully dove into that without really realizing that it was having any toll on me until it was having an extreme toll on me. And I was sleeping all the time. And, you know, I needed my therapist to be like, dude, like that's burnout. And when, when she said it to me, I was like, oh gosh, like, it clicked so well. And she was so right, which she is about a lot of things. But, you know, I think it it just is so resonating to see someone else's eyes like reflect back to you that not just like what you're struggling with is real, but like that, like give it a name, I think can be helpful or like, you know, make you feel like you deserve to have those feelings Mm -hmm. or that your experience matters. Like, I mean, she called me a frontline worker and I probably hadn't used that word for myself the entire pandemic because I didn't feel like I was doing what the ER doctors or what you do in your clinic. Like, I just didn't feel like I was doing the same thing, even though obviously I'm doing a lot for people to keep their emotions going and they can't do their jobs without it. But that word just like, didn't feel like it was true until like, she was like, uh, <laughs> you know, and I think it can be really helpful to have that and have somebody else's eyes, like holding that for you. Absolutely. Um, Just a quick question. Well, I guess I have two and I'm watching the chat in case any others come up. Um, What do you say to people who come to you and say, um, I'm not sure if I have anxiety, depression, if it's quote unquote, just situational grief, trauma, burnout, um, how, you know, yeah. What advice do you give when people feel like they're trying to tease that out for themselves Yeah, um, and they don't know what to do? Super hard question in the pandemic because all of us have some baseline level of something. I think before it wouldn't have necessarily always been the case, but I think in the pandemic, like a lot of people struggle with concentration. A lot of people are tired. A lot of people have like had experiences where they're like have insomnia. So it's like, why am I like this? And for me, really the big ways to decide like where it crosses the threshold are like, how long has it been going on? If it's something that's been going on like a day or two versus weeks, that's very different. How much is it interfering with your day-to-day life is like probably the best measure of all things, which is to say like day-to-day life for me would be so social, academic, spiritual, all of the things that really matter to you in your life. Are there things that you want to be doing that you're not doing because of it completely subjective that might make somebody come two months earlier to someone else, but it doesn't matter because if it affects you and it affects your life, it matters to me. And then I think, you know, getting worse would be like the third thing is like, did I have one panic attack? And now I have seven, like, that's a reason to get help. Um, I think though, for me, no matter what you call it, if it bothers you, if it's something you want to talk about, if it's something you feel like you need space for, if you want to know, if you have a diagnosis, like ask for help, you know, like there's no wrong time to ask for help or, you don't need a diagnosis like uh, that you look up and are sure you relate to, to ask for help, you know, help is there when you need it. And I wish we would use it more in a preventive stage instead of when people do come to me, which tends to be a lot later when they've struggled with, mm-hmm. you know, avoiding going to get help for a very long time or stigma for a very long time. And then it's much harder to treat. And I'd rather have a conversation a year before. One last question that's coming in, in the chat. Um, this is for, uh, could you recommend 
book, podcast, resources, um, whatever it might be that openly talks about mental health or burnout. And please feel free to mention your own articles by name or anything else you recommend. Um, your work is so insightful and funny and full of practical advice. So book, podcast, um, yeah. articles, et cetera. Um, e- everything Brene Brown's ever written and said is probably up there for me. So it has a podcast, great podcast also has, you know, books, almost all of them are about like vulnerability and leadership. And I think just great. And yeah, she's, and she, you know, academically yeah. trained. And if that really matters to you, I think some people get that as a thing. There's a new book about burnout by two sisters. Their last name is Nagowski. I think their book is quite good. And it's more of a pop pressed kind of look at it. But I think it's really interesting entertaining. I think people find solace in things like that Glennon Doyle has written for the same reason, because she's lived experiences and talking through her own lived experiences. And she has a podcast and she also has like untamed, but I'm also a big fan of love warrior, which would have been her first book. I think people can resonate with what she talks about because of that. And she also talks about the value of medication. You know, I, I have listened to like, I'm a big storyteller fan. So I do like your podcast, Lucy, (laughs) because it talks, you know, is about people's stories and experiences. I like Dak Shepherds for the same reason. They're authentic stories where people are talking about their struggles and you can feel seen. You might not feel seen every time, but you'll, it might not be about mental health specifically, but you'll read it or hear it. And you'll know that that like, oh, that happened to me too. Um, If you're curious about things I wrote, they're mostly on my website, which is just drjessiegold.com. And there's just like a bunch of them, probably the most like openly authentic piece that I've written in a while is a piece I wrote for NPR about being a psychiatrist who's burnt out myself and taking care of people. Um, I also did the audio for that. So you can listen to that. But I think that one for me, is probably the hardest piece I've written in a while, but probably one of the more like, you know, vulnerable and important pieces I've done. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and again, that's Dr. Jesse Gold. Um, uh, she's at Dr. Jesse Gold across uh, social platforms and then drjessiegold.com. Um, I'm going to read a poem that you sent me recently um, about emotion. Um, and on um, my podcast, Gravity, we close everything with a poem um, because poetry sometimes is a language all its own and it can feel so validating. And I used to be so intimidated by poetry. And then I realized that it was because I hadn't read the right poems. <laughs> and I just, you know, this is one that you love. So um, this poem is called Guest House by Rumi. Um, so I just want to read it back to you. Um, this being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Special thanks to you, Dr. Jesse Gold. Um, Dr. Gold is Assistant Professor of Psychiatry and Director of Wellness Engagement and Outreach in the Department of Psychiatry at Washington University in St. Louis School of Medicine. You can find her on social at Dr. Jesse Gold and at drjessiegold.com. I'm Dr. Lucy Kalanithi. I'm a clinical associate professor of medicine at Stanford and host of the new podcast, Gravity, about what becomes possible when we think of hardships differently. Uh, You can find me on Twitter at RocketGirlMD um, and the Commonwealth Club at CW Club. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us to everybody. Um, Take good care of yourselves and thanks again. Thanks.